today I have something to show you that I think is quite cool, so I'll waste no time and jump straight into it. First and foremost is the scriptable tool. Suitable for static environments, this provides an alternate approach to applying colour points, in stark contrast to the somewhat performant heavy real-time approach demonstrated in my previous video that led itself to procedural environments. With this tool, we can very quickly populate an area with a set of locations, each mapped to the user-defined gameplay tags relating to the colour points. The only thing that the area actor needs to do with this data is to empty it out appropriately into the subsystem's collection on begin play, and we're ready to go. As you can see, I've painted out some points within our environment, and the sounds are spawning appropriately at runtime. We have a few different tool settings, such as the brush size, the approximate number of points to paint within the brush area, and of course the ability to erase painted locations. Furthermore, we can also remove existing points with the help of the gizmos, show the location, change in location, and single the debug out only to the most recent gizmo. For when things get a bit overwhelming, we can filter out the colour point display. This uses some really neat code to loop through the enumerators of a bitwise integer using geometric progression, and blacklist indices that indirectly map to gameplay tags. I'll go over this more a bit later. Lastly, with the power of C++, we can retrieve the camera location in the viewport and call gizmos that exceed a user-defined distance as well. I don't see any reason why we don't have this as a node already. I could happily sit here all night and add more features such as the ability to define trace channels and so on, which goes to show you how scalable and fun scriptable tools are to work with. But why go to all these links? Is there no other way to achieve this? Well, we can certainly use construction scripts, wishful vectors, call and editor functions and debug arrows to achieve the same effect as demonstrated, but the process is considerably slower. Furthermore, vector widgets disappear when clicking off the actor and entering other editor modes, and stretch with the actor scale, which is why it's important to use box extents over scale when defining an area. I did steal and expand upon this code from Ryan Sweeney that I've linked in the description that allows us to render world space debug text in the editor to make up for the previously mentioned shortcomings of construction scripts. But you can achieve the same effect with Scriptable Tools HUD API to draw text at a location, although this will only be visible while using the tool. Furthermore, construction scripts will only update when the user makes a change to its only actor directly, such as translating, manually changing a value, or compiling. This means that changes made by external forces, such as scriptable tools, or even other construction scripts, will not immediately apply. To get around this, we can go into C++ again and write a line of code to allow us to rerun the construction script. You'll also notice that scriptable tools allow us to rerun construction scripts as you drag an actor through the editor, but this doesn't really help given our use case. To begin with a technical exposition, I'll first cover the tool script setup. You notice that scriptable tools allow us to get all of the selected actors, and with this we can simply get the first index if the player has accidentally selected multiple, or spit out a warning message if they are selected none of the correct class. We want to force shut down the tool if this happens to ensure that the tool is never fully initialized, unless the player has a valid selection. Once a player has a valid selection, we can clear any previous warnings using a custom event I set up to make this process easier, but looking back at this, I think the option for all messages was perhaps unneeded since we only have two options. Next, we'll add the property set, store a reference, and restore the settings using the associated save key. You'll notice that we're watching a bit more integer for any changes and updating the blacklist that I'll be going over a bit later. I've attempted to watch the color mapping property, however changes in sets don't seem to be detected, at least not in gameplay tags and linear color point structures. To get around this, I have an event timer later in the setup that compares a copy of the mapping to the current mapping to detect changes instead. We need to do this in order to refresh any arrows on screen whose colour is determined by the respective points tag. After that, we'll want to get any existing points, and before displaying these points, it's important to first fill a blacklist. This will determine what indices in the colour point mapping will be skipped in the Gillismo creation process, and there are a number of awkward hurdles to overcome here. So I first had to find a way to loop through the bitmask integer up to the number of bitmask entries, convert an index to a bit with a common ratio of 2, and check this against our filter's binary representation in order to decide what should and shouldn't be blacklisted, 
And lastly, nest another loop within the bitmask filter loop in order to translate the index back into an enumerator and then compare this against the string of the gameplay tag within the color point mapping. To help you understand this a little better, I'll take a moment to visually explain how the code fits into the bitwise operation, as well as why the bitwise operation will output zero when the corresponding bit is disabled. First of all, it's important to understand that in the binary system, each bit represents an increasing power of 2, with the rightmost bit representing 2 to the power of 0, the next representing 2 to the power of 1, then 2 to the power of 2, and so on. Because we only have 3 bit mask enumerate entries, we're only concerned about the first 3 bits from the right. So if we wanted to enable only trees, so it would be stored as 1, where 1 in the first bit represents trees being enabled. If we want to enable trees and grass, we would set the next bit to 1, giving us 1, 1. However, in Unreal, the bitwise initial will output its value as a decimal number, not in binary. To convert from binary, we simply sum the powers of 2 represented by each 1 bit. For example, grass and flowers would be stored as 1, 0, 1, so we'll just add 1 and 4 together to get 5. If all 3 were enabled, this would give us 1, 1, 1, meaning we would add 4, 2 and 1 together, giving us a bitwise integer value of 7. So now we know how the values are stored, how do we iterate through each bit and find out what's enabled and disabled? Well, it's pretty simple. We first take the number of enumerator entries and subtract 1 to give us the last index of our loop. And we need to do this because the first index should be 0, which is the same exponent as the first bit. We then raise 2 to the power of the index, and just like that, we're iterating through the bits. All that's left to do now is to query the bits, which can be done with a bitwise AND operation. Luckily for us, all we have to do in the engine is to hook up our bitwise integer and our value as a result of 2 to the power of the index, and it will spit out either 0 or the bit where 0 represents the disabled enum in that bit. In order to understand why, we can look at exactly what the bitwise operation is doing behind the scenes. If we take a previous example where only the grass is disabled, resulting in a bitwise integer of 5 or 101, the operation would multiply each bit with the corresponding bit of the second input, that being our value of 2 to the power of the index. So for the first index, we have the number 1 in binary, so 001, and our bitwise integer 101. 1 multiplied by 1 is 1, 0 by 0 is 0, and 1 by 0 is also 0, resulting in 0, 0, 1, or just 1 as far as the output of our bitwise AND operation is concerned. On the second index, we then have the number 2 in binary, so 0, 1, 0, and our bitwise integer again, 1, 0, 1. Doing the same multiplication gives us 0, 0, 0, as none of the pairs of bits match to 1. This means the bit is disabled, and the corresponding enumerator must also be disabled. I believe that having this base level of understanding is necessary when it comes to bitwise operations, as a common misconception for those starting out is that the bitwise AND operator will only output 1 or 0, but you can see that the next multiplication gives us 4. This just means that the third bit from the right, that being bit 2 to the power of 2 or 4, is equal to 1. Lastly, we can observe the importance of subtracting 1 from the length of our enumerator entries. If we took an index and exponent of 3, then we'd end up with 8 in binary, occupying 4 bits one bit longer than our bitwise integer at three bits. When we bitwise AND two binary numbers of unequal lengths, the operation is performed with the shorter binary number implicitly padded with leading zeros to match the length of the longer binary number. In our case, this would just give zero as demonstrated. Back to our code, once we find a disabled bit, we just loop through each value, getting the string from the gameplay tag, and see if this contains our disabled enumerator. If so, we just add the index to the blacklist. Once it loops through the filter up to the number of possible bits, all that's left to do is to reset the gizmos and update the construction script of the area actor. This is fortunately very simple and can be called on any actor as so. When we reset our gizmos, we first need to destroy all the active gizmos, reset a gate that allows our new gizmos to be created with respect to the blacklist, flush any persistent lines, draw the new lines, and lastly, create the new gizmos. In the setup, we'll toggle gameplay tag visibility of the debug string component off, since we'll be utilising the HUD API instead to draw debug strings, and call the gizmos by the distance from the editor camera if the user desires. While it is possible to watch the distance property, it's much cheaper just to check it on the timer instead. To achieve the culling, we store the camera's position in the viewport using the code mentioned earlier, and loop through the active gizmo array that is defined when we create our gizmos. By getting the distance between the last recorded camera position and the position of the gizmo, we can then compare this result to the user's defined distance and toggle the visibility accordingly. While people would usually erase and paint a new location upon making a mistake, some might prefer to drag a gizmo and visualise the change. Fortunately, scriptable tools make gizmo transform changes easy to keep track of. State changes tell us what type of operation was performed and when, whereas transformation changes fire every single time a transform is modified, such as dragging the gizmo. 
personally, I'm using this to draw a line from the old location to the new location, and by storing the recently changed gizmo as identifier, we can use the HUD API to either draw text displaying the change in location on one gizmo or all of the gizmos, depending on the user's settings in the property set. The difference between the x, y, and z of the old location and the new location is calculated by subtracting each element of the vector and selecting either an absolute value or a negative value, depending on which input was larger, and then formatted appropriately into text. I also do a couple of other things within the HUD API, such as displaying the current painting tag at the cursor location, and displaying the gameplay tag on each point. Speaking of the cursor, I'm keeping track of whether or not the user can paint on hold the begin and end, tracing with the input device race structure's origin and direction. More importantly, on click, we have access to a few modifiers that allow the tool to perform different operations such as painting and erasing. Erasing is a relatively simple task as we compare the distance between each point and the cursor location and check if this is less than the brush size, however things get a bit more complicated when we want to paint. You might think that you could simply generate a set of random numbers and discard any outside the brush radius, and you'd be right, but there's actually a much less performant heavy approach that does not rely on rejection sampling. For that, we'll have to look into polar and Cartesian coordinates. Put simply, polar coordinates move around a circle instead of horizontally and vertically like Cartesian coordinates do. They consist of two parts, that being the radius, or the distance from the centre point of the circle, and the angle about which we rotate around the centre point. I have linked further reading about this in the description. We can guess our polar coordinates using the following math and convert them to Cartesian as shown. Interestingly enough, Unreal's math utility also contains code to do so. From there, it's as simple as adding this vector to the mapping. You can take this one step further by exploiting the area of a circle to gain a more even distribution. Last of all, our shutdown will handle the flushing of lines and application of new point locations. Of course, we'll need to rerun the construction scripts at this point as well. That concludes the showcase of the tool and most of its features, so I hope you gained some ideas for your own tools, or even learned a thing or two along the way. Once again thank you for watching, and don't hesitate to leave a comment if you'd like to see me produce a tool for a different purpose as well.